Well, I just thank you all so much for coming. It's hot. We kind of have COVID situation with masks, and I really appreciate it. You made the effort. Um, before we start, I also want to acknowledge that what I've learned is that we are on the traditional land of the Sauk and uh, Meskwaki and Potawatomi. And you know that these peoples have had a very painful history, and we respect the indigenous people that live here today. So thank you. So I really can't thank you enough, and especially Bishop Hill Heritage Association for inviting me. Um, I like to see a show of hands. How many of you are new to Bishop Hill? Ooh, okay, a couple. How many of you are colony descendants? Oh, okay, that's a, a, large, a large loyal group. Um, well, as Marie said, I really am obsessed with researching the women in the colony. I mean, I, I'm really interested in everything about the colony, but you know, in the past, not surprisingly, the women's stories have gotten kind of short shrift, and there's plenty of information about them. Um, I live in Seattle, but my mother, Jan Florine, grew up here in Bishop Hill, and she loved this place. So we've had that connection through my mom over the years. Um, I was fortunate early on to learn to speak Swedish. I lived in Sweden for a year, went to university there. And also, I'm retired, and so I've had the last 10 or so years to be able to devote to doing research on the colonists, and it is just more fun than I can tell you. Um, so you know if you know about the colony that Eric Jansen, the leader, the prophet, was quite a character, and no doubt a very strong personality. I was very interested in, well, what's life like <laughs> for his family, especially his second wife, Anna Sophia, and I wanted to know, well, who was she? What happened to her? Because she kind of fades out of the picture at some point. And most of all, the more I learned about her, the more I wanted to know, why did Anna Sophia do the things she did? Why did she make the choices that she made? So <laughs> about... Ten years ago, I was in the uh, Siebel Building archives, fiddling around in a file cabinet, and I found a folder marked Papers in Swedish. And since I can read Swedish, uh, and I was bored at that point, I started leafing through them. And there, I got a chill down my back because I found this as the opening of one of the papers, and it said, I was born and raised among better folk in the kingdom of Sweden and arrived in New York the 3rd of October, 1832. Well, I knew this was long before the Jansenists and I just kept reading this eight page handwritten thing and I soon realized this was some kind of memoir written by Anna Sophia, Jansen's second wife. I mean, I was extremely excited about this. This document had been unknown for 160 years, you know, and was basically languishing in a papers in Swedish folder. Um, so today what I want to do is pretty much tell you her story. This to me is a remarkable story. It's of an orphan who immigrated to America. It involves kidnapping and murder, which some of you I know are already familiar with. And it's really about a person who at one time was the most powerful woman of the Bishop Hill colony. And to me, Anna Sophia's story raises questions, actually raises more questions than it answers, but the questions about what was life like for women in the 1800s, mid-1800s, how much of their identity came through the men that they were associated with? How important was religion in the decisions that they made? And how much agency did they have? And how much did they actually have a say in their own lives? So I think those are interesting questions. I was trying to think about, well, why, why am I so interested in Anna Sophia? Um, I decided, well, in a way, she was kind of an outsider to the colony, and I am an outsider to Bishop Hill because I don't even live here. I live in Seattle. I grew up in Oregon, so, you know, we're both kind of involved with the colony, but for me, it's definitely at a distance. 
And, you know, I'm quite envious of those of you who are really here. Um, anyway, I hope by the time I'm finished with this little presentation that you will be inspired to learn more, especially about the women of the colony. Um, they, there are many, many more interesting stories. I have about 30 slides, which my daughter told me was a lot, but, and I thought we'd take questions afterwards, if that's okay with you. Um, so how many of you have been to Gothenburg? It's a, a handful, okay. So this is a city on the west coast of Sweden. Most of the Jansenists came from north central Sweden, and they came from big forested areas with big broad river valleys, lots of farming. Well, Anna Sophia actually came from Gothenburg. It was on the west coast. I couldn't figure out how to make the pointer thing work, but you know, can see where west is. And at that time, there were 13,000 people there. So that was a good sized town. Gothenburg, just imagine, you're in Gothenburg in those days. It is just full of life. It's a port city. There are ships coming and going. There is a fort there. There's a garrison posted in Gothenburg. So there's soldiers marching up and down the street. There's lots of trade. There's tons of activity. And there are sugar beet factories, because that's how they made sugar in those days. In the sugar beet factory, there was a young man who worked there and his name was Johan Bengtsson. And his wife had just had a baby. They, well, actually, you probably mostly, most of you know that in Sweden at the time, everyone had to belong to the state church, to the Lutheran church. And the Lutheran church had essentially divided up the entire country geographically into parishes. So wherever you were born, you belonged to a parish willy-nilly. She then was born in Christina Parish, and here you can see a picture of Christina Church in Gothenburg in those days. And that was her pastor when she was born, Sven Hillander. The record in the middle is her birth record, because the Swedish Lutherans were fantastic at keeping great records of births, deaths, marriages, etc. So in 1815, Johan Bengtsson, this sugar beet laborer, and his wife, who was 39 years old, had a baby, um, Anna Sophia. The dad, her dad was also a volunteer soldier. And he moved the family to a nearby parish called the Garrison Parish. That's where more of the soldiers were. But unfortunately, he died when she was two years old. In those days, Households had to be headed by a man in Sweden. So she was put under the guardianship of a local, or not a clergyman, but a local church official in the Lutheran church. Uh, he was called the Klokkara, which is probably the third highest ranking church official in a parish. And he was responsible for educating the children, vaccinating them. He was the cantor, basically, in charge of all the music. So he was a very responsible, trusted person. Um, a year later, though, um, her mother also died. I don't know of what. So Dahlander, Johann Dahlander, the Klokkera, who was essentially her foster father, sent her to live with his own mother. I, my suspicion is, but I don't know, is that she may have been a maidservant in that family, a piga. Anyway, this is the better family that she mentions in her memoir at the outset, that she was raised in a better family. So I've tried to figure out, <laughs> why did she leave? I've got two hypotheses, and I'm sure you'll think of more. One is, that might have been a very strict and devout household. Just almost bet it would be. And she was 17 years old. So, go figure. Another possibility is that family had three more sons who were older than she was in their 20s. And this was a very ambitious family. They had started out as farmers, moved to Gothenburg, took a fancier name, very ambitious. I'm just thinking there's a possibility they wanted to get this 17-year-old girl away from those boys. I don't know. It's a possibility. In any case, every year, merchant ships 
were leaving Gothenburg for America. So, July 1832, with the permission of her foster family, she left on this ship, the Minerva. And she was in the company of the Berner family. Not the dad, because he was a sailor and he was on a different ship. But the mom, Margaret, 37 years old, their eight, eight, 17 year old daughter, a couple little kids, and then somebody called Anna Riberg. Well, Anna Riberg is not Anna Sophia's name, but Anna is her name, and she's really the only person that this could have been. Um, so, actually, Eric Vikan, who's a very noted scholar in Jansen's history, uh, is the one who maintained that this must be Anna Sophia, or Anna Sophia, so to speak. So what's interesting to me, well, she's the same age as the daughter in the household, so they may have been classmates in communion class or something, I don't know. But also, it's interesting that her name comes right after the family, but with them. And that, in the church books, is where the servants' names would be listed. So my theory is, maybe she was working for old Mrs. Dahlander, and then she ended up somehow getting on the boat with a, this other family and going along, maybe helping out with these little kids since the dad wasn't around, I don't know. Anyway, there they are, they spend weeks at sea, they get to New York Harbor. Now, how many of you speak quite a lot of Swedish? Okay, we got a few. Uh, well, she didn't speak any English, I'm pretty sure. So here you are, 17 years old, you land in New York City, and you don't speak any English. That could have been interesting. So New York City in 1830 was enormous. It was 185,000 people. So it was much, much bigger than her hometown. I think she probably lived with the Burners. The dad, Peter Burner, quit, quit the sea, and he found a place for his family to live on Rector Street. So I'm thinking that's probably where she lived too. And of course, 17, she's getting to be marriageable age. Now the following summer, after they arrived, a brig came from, it was called the Coral Mondel. It came from St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. So of course I had to go and find out why, what, what, what's that doing there? Well, there was the sugar beet, or not sugar beet, sugar cane industry going on. So enslaved people in St. Thomas were sending, or their bosses were sending sugar to New York. So this is where that sugar trade came along. Anyway, on that boat was a sailor, Anders, 24 years old, and he was a ship's carpenter, originally from Stockholm. And I have wondered, well, how did they meet? But actually, Peter Berner, the dad and the family where she'd come over, he was also a ship's carpenter. So we've got two Swedish ship's carpenter. It wouldn't be very surprising if they somehow met each other. In any case, I don't know the date exactly, but sometime between when she was 18 and she was 20, Anna Sophia married this sailor, Anders. Of course, he was a sailor. He had to go back to sea. So he did, and he didn't return. The presumption was that he was lost at sea. And of course, they wouldn't have been married very long. They had no children. <laughs> the issue was that in those days, the presumption of death was seven years. So what that meant was 20 years old, Anna Sophia would have to wait seven years to get married again. This puts her in a very difficult situation, really. So what could she do? Well, she tells us, she says, in the same city where I lived for 14 years, he means New York, I became united with a man of higher class. Well, who was that? Turned out that she had gone to boarding school in New York. And her teacher's name was George Pollock. He was 
educated. He had English ancestry, he wasn't Swedish. And his family was involved with the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He was sort of a blue blood, I guess. He was a clerk on Wall Street, and he lived on Greenwich Avenue. So first, Anna Sophia was his student, and then she became his assistant in the classroom. And as soon as it was legal, she married him. I really wish I could have been a fly on the wall because this is an interesting story. <laughs> so at that point, Anna uh, Sophia was 26 or 27 years old. Pollock himself was 42, and it was his first marriage. So <laughs> the problem was that Anna Sophia, of course, had grown up in, not only grown up in the Lutheran church, but grown up with an official in the Lutheran church and a probably strict and devout household. This man was a Methodist. And not only that, he was a prominent Methodist. He, well, I guess we got one more to go. There we go. Yeah, sorry. He was the secretary of something called the Methodist Asbury Society. And Four years after the two of them got married, the Asbury Society created this basically floating church in New York that was supposed to cater to new immigrants and Swedish sailors. The idea was that it was a floating Bethel ship. Um, it was docked at Pier 11 on the North River, which today we call the Hudson River. And it was at the foot of Rector Street, right near the Burners. So all these little threads are coming together, you see. And for their first preacher, they hired a Swedish man from Småland in southern Sweden. His name was Olaf Hedstrom. And Peter Burner, that you've now gotten to know quite well, he was his assistant in the church. Anna Sophia, in her memoir, says that she soon became one of Hedstrom's most devoted parishioners. So she is enthusiastic. Well, that lasted, I guess, about a year, late, about a year, because a year later, she met Eric Jansen. Eric Jansen, the founder of this colony, had fled Sweden through the mountains of Norway on skis with his, and then and, and met up with his family in what is now Oslo, and they sailed across the ocean with false papers. Um, they landed in New York, and they had to stay there for a little while because his wife was still recovering from yet another childbirth. That first wife, I think, personally was a saint, by the way. Anyway, <laughs> Jansen then, since he was in New York anyway, was invited to come and preach on the Bethel ship in Swedish. And Anna Sophia writes about that. She says, two days after Eric Jansen came to my house, he has, by preaching the word, convinced me that my belief and life were devilish and false. Then she complains about the Methodists, and she accuses them of hypocrisy, crying and whooping, stamping and clapping. So that was not her style. I think it's amazing that she converted to Eric Jansen's sect in two days. Um, kind of amazing. Um, so within a few weeks, the Jansen party, the small Jansen party was on their way west. Thank you. Oh yeah, there's our there's the interior of a different uh, Bethel ship in Pennsylvania, just so you see what they look like on the inside. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So they went, as many of you know, they came to Illinois because Olaf Hedstrom, the Methodist preacher in New York, had a brother, Jonas Hedstrom, who was a Methodist preacher here in Illinois. So that was a thousand mile journey, by the way. Jansen's had, Jansen had sent a scout looking for a good place for his utopia, for his communal society. And around near Victoria is where they ended up. On this journey from New York, George Pollock and so Anna Sophia Pollock went along with the Jansenists. And I've really thought about that because George Pollock, he left his home, his friends, his family, 
his job and his position in the Asbury Society to follow his wife, who wanted to follow the Swedish preacher that no one had ever heard of. And I doubt that George Pollock knew much Swedish, frankly. Anyway, on this journey out to Illinois, they helped guide, and also Anna Sophia translated and interpreted for Jansen, and she tutored his young son in English, because her English was fluent by then. When they got to Victoria, the Jansen family stayed with the Hedstrom family, and the Pollocks stayed with one of their neighbors. And the description is pretty ah, alarming. They lived in kind of these log cabins in Victoria, uh, dirt floors, snakes dropped from the ceilings into the beds at night seeking warmth from people's bodies. I mean, I would so be sleeping outdoors if this happened to me. That's all I can say. <laughs> Jonas Hedstrom, who's also my ancestor, by the way, so I'm interested in him. Anyway, he was a blacksmith, so I can just imagine Anna Sophia hearing the anvil ringing and also hearing the loud arguments between Jansen and Hedstrom because they were both unbelievably stubborn and convinced of their own religion. So they argued about a religion and I think um, there's no secret as to why the Jansenists then went north <laughs> 12 miles to found the colony. What, as far as I can figure out, it looks like when they went, went up here to this area, Red Oak and Bishop Hill area, that George Pollock stayed behind in Victoria with the Methodists. Anna Sophia writes about this in her diary, and she says, the first year, 1846, Hedstrom incited my husband to come and with violence take me from my friends, meaning in Bishop Hill. But when my husband saw that I under no circumstances could be compelled to follow him, he gave up seeking after me. So this was kind of a strong-willed wife, in my opinion. She, anyway, there she is. In October, George Pollock died in Victoria, allegedly of a broken heart. He was 47 years old, no children. So once again, Anna Sophia was a widow. Well, most of you know that the Jansons family was then joined by more and more parties of Jansonists. Ships full of Jansonists kept arriving in New York and made their way out here. And that first winter, there were about 400 people and they lived under terrible conditions. They dug these dwellings in the ravine. These dugouts were crowded. There was disease, people were starving. About a fourth of the colonists died, and many of those were children. But in January, nonetheless, the Jansenists started a little school in one of the dugouts. This is hard for me to grasp, by the way. 35 students, and they got a, a man to come and teach. He was a Presbyterian, Mr. Talbot, and his assistant was Mrs. Sophia Pollock. So now she actually has um, a, a job, essentially, in Bishop Hill. Well, Anna Sophia did not have to live for very long in a dugout because that spring, the Jansenists built the first frame house here in the village. And that was a house for Jansen's family. It was two stories at the time with a stove. It did not have all the wings on it that it has today, but the house is still here down the street. And Anna Sophia got the room next to Jansen's. So that was interesting. Thanks, Bob Nelson, for figuring that out, I guess. She soon became the principal of the school, and she was assisted by Jansen's young son, this little boy, Eric. Well, Finally, the colonists that year worked so hard and they finally got some crops, et cetera, et cetera, and things lightened up a bit. At the beginning, Jansen had banned marriages, wanted celibacy, et cetera, but by the following, the summer of 48, um, they had mass marriages. People had a chance to get married. 
okay, including one young man named Linyu Larsh Gabrielson. He was 32 years old. He was from Ostrafosh in Dalarna. He was from this farm. Dave and I visited this farm uh, when we were there. And this guy, Linyu Larsh, was an apostle, one of the 12 apostles that Jansen had appointed. He was the son of the wealthiest Jansenist. Now, they had put their money all in a common fund, but I think they remembered who had given the most. So, <laughs> And also, he was the young man who had helped Jansen escape on skis through the Norwegian mountains. So he was kind of the local hero boy, as far as I can figure out. Anyway, two years after George Pollock died, Anna Sophia married Lindu Larsh, and Eric Jansen signed their marriage certificate. And a year later, they had a baby, Isaac, or Isaac Gabrielson. But that was 1849. And a lot of you know that two months later, tragedy struck the colony. In August, cholera came, an epidemic just whipping through the colony. And the colonists turned this, as you can see, this wood frame weaving and spinning house into a sick house. They had roped in six nurses, untrained nurses, three per 12-hour shift. One of these nurses, Lars Lindbeck, later wrote about it because Lindu Lars was one of the first people to come down with cholera. And Lars Lindbeck was brought in to help out. He says, I was called upon at his bed of suffering. Then it was my lot to continually seek to relieve the pain of the sufferers. In truth, a disgusting job. And if you've read about how cholera proceeds, you know it was a disgusting job. And it was very sad because they didn't have germ theory. They had no idea what was happening to them. So Lindu Larsh, unfortunately, was one of the first to die in the Bishop of Colony, buried in an unmarked grave in the new colony cemetery. So now Anna Sophia, of course, is widowed for the third time. The cholera didn't go away. Colonists were dying every day, and the Jansenists were frantic to escape. OK. Yeah. Thank you. So a lot of them left, rushed to a place, a property called LaGrange Farm in Western Township near Orion, trying to flee the cholera. The Jansen family continued on, they went up to the fishing camp that the colony had on Rock Island, which today is called Arsenal Island, on the Mississippi. Anna Sophia and her baby went along with that group up to Rock Island. Now up there, this island at the time was just lush, blackberries, plums, apples, nuts. It seemed like an idyllic place. Surely they would be safe from the cholera. But of course they weren't. Jansen's wife, his first wife, and his two youngest children died up there and were buried who knows where on the island. So soon thereafter, Jansen and Anna Sophia came back to Bishop Hill with his two surviving children and her baby Isaac. Jansen was beside himself and he blamed the colonists for his wife's death. Eric Jansen believed that he had been appointed by God, anointed, I'm sorry, by God. He had founded a church. He had written hymns. And God had now told him to find a replacement wife. God had told him that whatever woman was called to be his next wife should show up in his room that night. Well, to make matters interesting, two women showed up. One was Anna Sophia. The other's name has not gone down in history that I know of anyway. Uh, so here we are, three weeks after Jansen's own wife died, which was three months after Anna Sophia's husband died, both from cholera. Anna Sophia married Prophet Eric Jansen. 
He was 41 years old, she was 34. So her status changed immediately. Not only was she now the prophet's wife, she was the stepmother to his two surviving children, Eric and Matilda. And also Jansen appointed her the bishopess, biskopinna, a new title, by the way, and appointed her spiritual mother of the colony and put her in charge of supervising all the women of the colony. The orphan from Gothenburg had, within just a very few short years, become the most powerful woman of the colony. Okay. Now in the colony, I think I did the math, the women outnumbered the men about two to one for very good reasons and not the reasons that some people claim. I just want to put that out there. Um, Olaf Kranz, who was a child in the colony, toward the end of that century, painted from memory scenes from colony life, and he included pictures of women doing colony work in work crews, planting, harvesting, pile driving over there on the river, all this field work and weaving and all kinds of things. Well, you have to wonder, how did those women from north central Sweden take to having Anna Sofia as their supervisor, a woman who had presumably never done a lick of farm work in her life. She had no experience with any of this, and there's no evidence that she even knew how to weave. I, I, I don't know, but I doubt it. Anyway, it may not have mattered because the supervising task couldn't, uh, vanished soon because Anna Sophia soon became embroiled in a domestic dispute involving Jansen's cousin, Charlotta. As many of you know, there was a Swedish man who came from Stockholm, entered the colony, sort of got involved in a token way, didn't really adhere to Jansen's beliefs, but he did end up marrying Jansen's cousin, Charlotta. When, and then he kind of went roaming around doing his thing out, outside the colony. When the cholera came though, his wife was very pregnant and he came back and tried to persuade her to leave the colony with him. Now, Jansen always claimed that there were prenuptial agreements about this and that she wasn't allowed to leave. No one has found any such written document anyway. Anyway, Charlotta refused to leave, and Jansen would not let her go. A few weeks later, she gave birth to John Root's baby. So one day in this building, which is unfortunately not here anymore, the big brick, Anna, um, Charlotta and the baby were upstairs in their room and the rest of the colonists were down in the dining hall in the basement having their meal. So while they were busy, John Root showed up with an American friend and a horse and a wagon and basically kidnapped his wife and baby. Well, somebody saw them leaving, sounded the alarm, and Jansen sent a half a dozen men on horseback following them. They soon caught up and re-kidnapped Charlotte back to the colony. And I will not go into all the details, tempting though they are, because it's, that's really Charlotte's story. But Root's friends and acquaintances formed a mob, came to Bishop Hill, threatened to burn it down. Not too long, by the way, after Nauvoo was attacked, uh, a, you know, a Mormon sect not too far from here. Anyway. They were trying to hide Charlotta. It went back and forth and back and forth. But the important thing is that in, that in those days, women were essentially the property of their husbands. So even though Eric Jansen was her male cousin, once they got to this country, he really wasn't her guardian after she got married. So Root had the law on his side. And he thought, of course, that Jansen was keeping him from his lawful wife. In any case, Root sued Jansen over this, and the sheriff of Henry County subpoenaed Charlotta and sequestered her, and this is where he put her, in the farm of P.K. Hanna, which is up by Green River. And P.K. Hanna was a Methodist preacher. 
She was actually spirited back and forth to several different places, including Chicago, but again, the details we have to leave aside right now. The main thing is that Anna Sophia was convinced that Charlotta was fleeing a violent husband, and she was prepared to help, no matter how she could. Also, she and Jansen had no faith in the law of Henry County. In fact, they thought that the Methodist preachers were out to get them. That's in her diary. The problem was they couldn't really hide Charlotte forever. They needed legal help. Okay. So Charlotte, Eric Jansen, and Anna Sophia took off 200 miles south to St. Louis on the Mississippi. At the time, St. Louis was the largest city in the country west of Pittsburgh, 77,000 people. Tall buildings, small shops, lots of new construction going on, steamboats coming and going on the river. And why were they there? Because they had a big city lawyer, Britton A. Hill, and here he is. And presumably, he was getting paid out of the colony treasury. That's some. Um, I would love to know what that bill turned out to be. <laughs> because Britton A. Hill lived at this place, the Planters Hotel, which was quite new at the time. And he tried cases here in the courthouse in St. Louis, which is still there. It's called the old courthouse now, of course. Anna Sophia was very busy while they were in, in St. Louis that spring. She interpreted for the lawyer and Jansen and everybody she helped Charlotte write her affidavit about what had happened to her. And Anna Sophia started writing her own memoir, trying to sway public opinion to be on Jansen's side in this dispute. OK, next one. So in her diary, she writes, friends of freedom, think about our freedom when I now have fled from my own state, from my murderers, in order to tell you this truth. Britton Hill was working on their defense of the case, of course, and even wrote to the governor. Well, the problem was they couldn't really stay in St. Louis either because Jansen was the head of the colony. He actually owned the entire colony, all the land, everything. So he needed to represent Bishop Hill Colony in court. And there were at least five real estate cases that involved the colony. So when spring court started in Henry County, spring session, Jansen, as a representative of the colony, was called back. And he came back to Bishop Hill full of foreboding. Okay. So that morning uh, in May, on a Monday morning, 1850, um, the case came to the courthouse in Cambridge. And just so you know, this courthouse is in Cambridge right now, and this is not the courthouse where this was heard, but neither is it the gigantic brick courthouse that is also seen in Cambridge today. There was a third courthouse that was, I'm sure, wouldn't look just like this one a little bit larger. So I put the slide in anyway. Anyway, this was the judge, Judge Kellogg. As luck would have it, the very same day, John Root had been called to court over a completely unrelated trespassing case. He was the plaintiff. So court went on in the morning. At lunch, everybody left, went downstairs. And upstairs in the courtroom were just two people, Eric Jansen and the clerk. The windows open. Eric Jansen looks out the window and sees John Root down in the yard. John Root yelled at him in Swedish. They then have an argument in Swedish about Charlotte. And supposedly, Jansen yells, I believe in Swedish, a sow is a good enough wife for you. OK, those are fighting words, are they not? Yeah. So suddenly, upstairs in the courtroom, John Root appears in the window, in the doorway, I'm sorry, in the doorway, calls Jansen's name. Jansen looks over. Root has his pistol and shoots him twice and kills him instantly. 
of course, he's standing in the courtroom. He got arrested immediately. So that part wasn't hard. But Anna Sophia is now widowed for the fourth time. Okay, I'm going to stop here for just a second to get a little reading. Do you think she was uh, an optimist or an opportunist? How many think she was an opportunist? Getting some. Um, yep, okay. Do you think her life was privileged or precarious? How many say privileged? Not so many. How many say precarious? Okay. How many think she was lucky versus unlucky? Lucky. Unlucky. Okay. There's a, there's a lot here to unpack, isn't it? Okay. Well, when Jansen the prophet was murdered, many of the colonists were stunned. In fact, they apparently expected him to rise again on the third day. But he did not. The plan was, what he had wanted, was that his son would succeed him as leader of the colony, but that boy is only 12 years old. Well, in Illinois, the widow inherits the estate. So Anna Sophia actually became the legal administrator of the entire colony. She had a feeling that the colonists would not accept a woman's rule. So then there was the funeral in the church. And Anders Berglund, or Berglund, preached that funeral sermon. He was also one of the 12 apostles, one of Jansen's closest advisors. In fact, he had been put in charge of the communal treasury for the expedition to America. So he was a highly trusted Jansenist, very popular. At the end of the sermon, Anna Sophia laid her hand on his head to signify that he would now be the co-administrator with her of the colony until that boy grew up, Eric Jansen's son. However, their rule did not last long. A few months earlier, one of the colonists named Jonas Olson, I believe that is Cheryl's ancestor, by the way, led nine men <laughs> overland to Hangtown, which today is called Placerville in California. So Dave and I went there, took these pictures. Because of communications being what they were in those days, it was November before Jonas Olson got word out there in the gold fields that Eric Jansen had been murdered. I should also mention that the reason these particular nine men went west to hunt for gold was that they also happened to be the kidnappers who had kidnapped Charlotte. So kind of getting them away from the Henry County Sheriff wasn't a bad idea. Anyway, back to November, Jonas Olson left the rest of the guys digging gold and he got on a sailboat in San Francisco, went to Panama, I think he had to walk across the isthmus in those days, got up to New Orleans and up to the Mississippi. It took him till February to get to Bishop Hill. As soon as he got to the colony, he denounced Berglund and he wanted regime change. He persuaded the colonists to incorporate as a corporation, uh, run by seven trustees. That would be himself and half a dozen of his close associates from back home in Sweden. So within a year, Anna Sophia and Berglund had been ousted from power. So I, I was just trying to imagine what was life like for her in the colony under those conditions where she'd been promoted far above her station and now suddenly she's pretty much a nobody. So she did stay here though for four years, raising her son Isaac, but she really had no status and no future. Click. At this point, Anna Sophia is 40 years old. She moved 400 miles with a few other Jansenists down to the Shaker colony in Kentucky, Pleasant Hill. She brought along six-year-old Isaac, but what's interesting to me is she left behind the two stepchildren. Eric and Matilda stayed in the colony. Well, what are Shakers? 
it's a sect of the Quaker religion. And they were known for communalism, which is what the Jansenists believed in, known for nonviolence, which is what the Jansenists believed in, and known for celibacy, which some of the Jansenists believed in, but not all. <laughs> At Pleasant Hill, 300 people lived in dormitories, busy farming, raising cattle, and making furniture, shaker furniture. Their worship services were marked by plain song, like Amazing Grace, I guess, and so on, trembling, shaking, twirling, and frenzied dancing. Now, wait a minute. Remember, Anna Sophia doesn't like hooping and hollering in church and stamping and clapping, so I'm not sure this was all that great a fit for her. After three years with the Shakers, Anna Sophia brought her son Isaac back to Bishop Hill. And when she left, the Shakers called her a traitor. Well, she hadn't necessarily left under great conditions, uh, having lost all of her power in the colony. So what would life be like when she returned? How would they treat her? Lucky for her, the colonists had just, they were just in the process of finishing a beautiful, spacious, two-room schoolhouse, the one you see here in Bishop Hill today. But right about then, you know, there was the panic of 1857, big financial disaster in the country, and that revealed the extent of the huge amount of debt that the trustees had incurred for the colony. Uh, it also kind of, at that point, there started to be some sense of corruption and fraud in the colony. So at some point, those colonists, all the members, voted to dissolve the colony, which meant it would no longer be communal. All the assets would be divided, including the tiniest teaspoon. If you have seen the colony records, which are in the steeple building, that list every single object in the colony and how it was divided, every, every ounce of fabric, it's just an amazing read, honestly. So when they divided the assets, Anna Sophia got, because she was still a member of the colony, she got 26 acres of farmland near Galva. Her stepson Eric got 11 acres and her stepdaughter Matilda got seven, which was, this was a typical formula for women and children. Well, her stepson was going to start farming these three plots of land, but he soon joined the Union Army, 1861. So he goes off to the army, and she couldn't farm it without a man around. She had to make a living. So what opportunities did Anna Sophia have? Okay, next one. When the CB&Q Railroad came to Galva, the colonists had built a one-story wood frame boarding house on the southeast corner of Washington Park. It's still there, by the way, but it's larger than it was then. And they built this sort of boarding house hotel for Swedish immigrants who came to the area. And it said that it was fancier than the colony buildings. For example, it had long curtains. It had carpeting. The food was more varied and refined than what the colonists got. So Anna Sophia ran the boarding house. And later, some other colonists wrote that Anna Sophia ran a better restaurant, in other words, a good restaurant, but did not sell alcoholic beverages. I thought you might want to know that detail. <laughs> By now, Anna Sophia is in her mid-40s, so I'm sure her days were spent keeping the books, seeing to the laundry, all the meals of this boarding house, all the cleaning, she would have been interpreting for all these newcomer Swedes. Um, but at this point in her life, she was pretty much on her own. Next one. Her stepson, Eric, had left the army after a fairly short time, less than a year, I think, because of poor health. He married and moved away and began publishing newspapers and ultimately a book. 
Matilda, the stepdaughter, married a Captain Warner from Andover, and they moved to Iowa. Her own son, Anna Sophia's own son, Isaac, just disappeared. And one of my big excitements this summer was I actually found a little clip about him in a Michigan newspaper from 1882. Here it is. Isaac Gabrielson, while drunk last evening, walked against a window as he was coming downstairs in his office and came near falling through. The broken glass almost severed his nose from his face leaving it hanging only by a slender strip of flesh. Dr. Kuhn sewed the nasal organ in place, but Ike's good looks are spoiled. <laughs> I can't tell you, I burst out laughing, honestly, when I found that little tidbit, because we didn't know what happened to him. Turned out that Isaac Gabrielson was working in this town here, Buchanan, Michigan, near the lake, 200 miles east of here, and he was a printer for an Adventist newspaper. So he, in fact, you know, had a job and everything. Next one. Well, Anna Sophia's health deteriorated, and she ended up, because all three of those children were long gone, she ended up at the Henry County Poor Farm. It was on 160 acres, 16 miles north of here. You'll recognize it as the site of the Hillcrest home today. It was relatively new at that time. It was a showpiece of brick and stone, 64 rooms that were for inmates, as they called them, that were said to be light and airy rooms. Men were in one wing, women in the other. They had bathrooms on each floor hot and cold water, steam heat. I think it's just unbelievable, but it cost them at the time $50,000, which in today's money would be over a million and a half. They really invested in Henry County in this so-called poor farm or infirmary. They called it both things. So the people who lived there were poor and homeless, essentially. They were expected to do the chores and the gardening. That was typical for these poor farms. But many of them were ill, or like Anna Sophia, or injured. And this place had a separate asylum for the more troublesome of the insane. So this is not, it looks luxurious, but if you don't have any family coming, it just, I don't think she liked it. Um, one source said that she longed for her son Isaac to come and rescue her. Unfortunately, when she was 72 years old, she got a message roundabout from a lawyer in Galva who had heard from somebody that her son Isaac had drowned in a storm, a bad storm up in Michigan. Well, this must have been a devastating blow. Eight months after this death, Anna Sophia died at the poor farm. She'd been married to Eric Jansen for less than a year. She was his widow for the next 38 years. She's buried next to Jansen in the Bishop Hill Cemetery, but the monument does not list her name. Later, people in Galva found out that at the time she died, Isaac was still alive and well up in Michigan, but she had never seen him again. So, what do we know about her? Well, Anna Sophia was different from most of the women of the colony. She'd grown up in the West Coast, not up North. In fact, that meant she would have a different dialect and an accent and everything. She'd grown up in a city. Most of them had grown up on farms, nearly all of them. She had no relatives in America, whereas most of the Jansenists came in family groups or with their boss or somebody they knew. And she was also very educated. She was bilingual. She was a fluent writer. 
And she was an experienced teacher, interpreter, translator, secretary, and manager. And I, I know I don't know how deep her faith was exactly, but she kind of looks like a religious seeker. She was a Lutheran, then a Methodist, then a Jansenist, then a Shaker. So that's a lot. But her family life was a disaster. She'd been married four times, a sailor, a teacher, a farmer, and a prophet. But widowed four times. She was abandoned and deceived by her only child. And she died at the poor farm. Well, this made me want to know what kind of, that, those are the facts, but what kind of person was she? Well, next one. Thank you. We have no photographs of her. And I realized this week, just thinking about it, that Olaf Kranz knew her. He, she was around when he lived in the colony, and they both lived in Galva at the same time, which was not enormous at the time. He definitely knew her, yet there don't seem to be any Kranz portraits of her, in contrast to at least three of Jonas Olson. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. But there are a few quotes by people who knew her. One woman said she dressed better than the other ladies. A man said she was, had gifted appearance and talents. And another said she was exceedingly handsome, composed, and dignified. Well, I thought that was very interesting. This is the image that she projected. Calm, dignified, composed. And then we have the memoir, which brings out a totally different side of her. It shows somebody who's, first of all, very class conscious, gullible, I would say, but also passionate and fierce. She was defending Jansen no matter what. What I realized was Anna Sophia arrived here in Jansen's own party. She was here from the beginning. She was here when he founded the colony 175 years ago. I believe that her skills and her expertise and her just sheer grit were critical to the survival of the colony, especially in those first few years. The thing is, Anna Sophia had no descendants. Today we honor her. Thank you. One more slide. I especially want to call out the Heritage Association. Cheryl Dow, who's like my research go-to, and Dave Wall, who is my trip and technology go-to. So thank you. I think, I think we do have time for some questions. OK, so thank you.